Hello, and thank you so much for joining us today for the webinar GBR in my daily practice, Tent Technique, Cortical Struts, Max Graft, Bone Builder, Xenograft, PRF and more, selection of materials and techniques to achieve best results. It is a great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Krzysztof Mielewski, whose aim during this presentation will be to share his experience and detailed information about bone regeneration in challenging situations. Dr. Kmielewski graduated in 1993 from the Medical Academy in Gdansk. Since 1996, he has his own practice, which is focused on aesthetic dentistry and implantology. He is a board member of the Polish Academy of Aesthetic Dentistry and a member of the American Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry. He is an international speaker in the field of implantology, aesthetic treatment and dental photography and an educational director in dental photo master program. We would like to thank Dr. Kimielewski for being with us today and Botis for making this lecture possible. Please take note of any questions and comments you have during the lecture, as they will be addressed by Dr. Kmielewski at the end of the presentation. Without any further delay, please help me welcome the expert himself, Dr. Krzysztof Kmielewski. Hi, hello. My name is Chris, and uh, I thank you very much for your kind introduction, and I would like to thank as well uh, Botis Academy for this uh, chance and the possibility to present you uh, my work and my experience. Uh, my topic for today is uh, guided bone regeneration in my daily practice. I am dentist almost 22 years now this year and uh, I am focused on implantology and aesthetic dentistry uh, with special attention to guided bone regeneration almost 20 years now. And so over this time, I learned a lot of things and I experienced a lot of problems and I had to learn how to solve some of the difficulties. And still I have a lot of doubts and question marks. And my goal is an intention to share with you my experience, to share with you some solutions, which I think may help us in our daily practice. And uh, starting from the first slide, uh, I would like to, of course, um, uh, introduce you a little a bit to my world. I work in my office in Gdansk, and uh, this is in the north uh, part of Poland on the seacoast. And uh, I started last year in working in my uh, new clinic, which I um, established and uh, prepared to give the best comfort to my patients and uh, my staff as well, and to bring the best quality of the treatment also with the best quality of the service. Because our patients, sometimes, they cannot express their expectations, but something what uh, is common and the same for expectation is just to bring back aesthetic, bring back smile, and bring back the function. Of course, uh, we have to deal uh, with the best uh, quality of materials, how to bring uh, this natural look of the restoration, starting from the composites, uh, so through the ceramic, uh, through the, all the prosthetic restorations. But uh, we as the surgeons, we have to deal with the big problem which can um, ruin the final aesthetic work, which is the ground, this base, which is actually bone and soft tissue. Especially with the soft tissue, we can experience a lot of problems, but soft tissue without the proper solid um, um, bag uh, to support from, from the bone will not be able to stay and survive over the long time. So in my office, we uh, do a lot of different type of treatments, starting from the autogenous bone block grafting, uh, through the um, uh, transplantations, uh, different types, but also we work a lot of uh, uh, with uh, different types of materials like allografts, like xenografts, and also synthetic materials. And when we plan our procedures, we have to differentiate and answer uh, to find and answer the question what kind of material we want to use and what kind of technique would be uh, appropriate to the materials which we are using. Because no matter what we are doing, 
we have to make the decision, okay, in this specific case, which type of material is best for patient and for my skills and technique which I want to apply. Because now we can be confused a little bit with different materials which are present on the market. But in my office we have specific approach which is based on the biology because I think the more we know about biology and about the behavior, about the bone healing, about the cells, then it's much easier to select uh, the appropriate technique and select the appropriate material. That's why in the first part of this um, webinar I would like to give you uh, some kind of um, my thoughts, how I, how I think, what is important when we select different materials. No matter what type of procedure we will go, what type of defect we will, he uh, we will try to treat, or what kind of trauma will happen, within the bone we will experience the same type of um, healing. There are four phases, four stages of bone healing. The first one is hemostasis, the second one is inflammatory phase, the first one the third one is a um, uh, proliferative phase, and the third one, fourth one is remodeling. For me as a clinician, I want to improve especially these this first three stages, these first three phases, starting from hemostasis, where we have the bleeding and we want to create as quickly as possible the clot. We can improve it by adding some um, uh, different type of sponges made of collagen because we know when platelets will uh, have a contact with collagen immediately they will aggregate and they will uh, stop the bleeding that's why we use these collagen sponges then it's very important to know what we can experience in this inflammatory phase which is a must to have um, to have the proper healing because during the inflammatory phase our organism will prepare the wound for proper new tissue formation because during this stage we are, uh, the organism is cleansing uh, the wound by um, with the uh, support of granulocytes and macrophages all the bacteria all the debris will be removed from the wound then when the wound is clean the process of proliferation can start and it starts from angiogenesis because nutrition and bringing back the oxidation of the tissue is very important to start the process of building the bone. When the bone, fresh bone, is created, we will have this fresh type of bone called woven bone, which then, during the process of remodeling, will be changed uh, to the functional bone. It will be sponges or cortical bone, depending on uh, the area. In this uh, portfolio we have three types, three groups of the uh, materials, starting from the allografts, which is max graft. Uh, we have the xenografts, uh, where we have the cerabone, this is this bovine origin material. We have as well alloplastic material, synthetic one, which is the max resort. Uh, in uh, different materials we will have different response of the tissue. And I like very much this slide which is in front of you. We have uh, three uh, actually histological uh, pictures. First one is with Max Graft, where underneath the name you see the description that this is optimum resorption and remodeling. And this is the way how autogenous bone and how allograft behaves in the bone. When it is implemented during the process of healing, the volume of the material will be resorbed and replaced with the new fully functional bone. This is the gold standard. And the same is with allograft, the same is with autogenous bone in general. The second one is max resort. This picture uh, represents uh, the behavior of the synthetic materials, where we have the information that this is controlled resorption and integration. Why? Because especially max resort, the composition is 40% of the uh, tricalcium phosphate and 60% uh, of the hydroxyapatite. This 40% of the um, uh, tricalcium phosphate within the first three to six months will be resorbed and replaced by the new bone. But 60% of the hydroxyapatite, which is more 
crystalline uh, structure will be integrated because it is not resorbing so quickly. It will stay, it will last for years. That's why it will be integrated in the tissue. It will keep the volume of the um, regenerated area. And the third group is represented by cerabon. This is the behavior of the materials from a bovine origin. We have uh, description, perfect integration. It means that this material, because during the process of preparation is heated, will be very uh, um, rigid, will be very hard, and it will not be resorbed over the time. That's why it will be integrated in between the uh, cells, in between the tissue of, of our bone, and it will be uh, as a hybrid structure, and it will protect the area, the volume which is um, uh, uh, remodeled, which is uh, built up from the resorption over the years. That's why the material like cerabone is used in the areas where we want to really keep for the long time uh, the volume of the regeneration. Uh, so on the next few slides, I will share how these different materials really behave in the bone. Within the first um, case, within the first few slides, I will show you how is uh, really behaving autogenous bone during this process of optimum resorption and remodeling. As you can see, this is the area of retromolar area of the linea obliqua externa in the mandible, and you see monocortical uh, area which will be harvested, and it will be monocortical block, which I will use for um, uh, tunnel technique uh, for the horizontal augmentation. And this is the case which I did uh, more than uh, 15 years ago. And uh, during the harvesting, you can see that there is no vessels uh, visible inside of the block. Uh, this is a solid structure. And I prepared the tunnel uh, where you can see the fixed block. There was no other biomaterial used, just a tunnel, according to the Professor Curie technique, and uh, no membrane, no any biomaterial, just as the membrane is intact um, uh, periosteum. And I uh, suture this area and I leave it uh, for the next few months. In this specific case, I make re-entry after four months, and you can see very nice healing of the soft tissue, and especially when we open the area, you can witness amazing result of the, an amazing proof of remodeling which happened, because when you pay closer attention, especially in this area, you can see even vessels. So it means that during the process, within this last four months, the process of remodeling brought back the nutrition and the volume of this block is, starts to be replaced by the living, freshly new built bone. And a very similar behavior we can experience as well with allograft. With allograft, uh, we can use them uh, in the different uh, um, options with the different uh, types of these materials because it can be granulated, it can be available in the blocks in the, um, uh, as the plates. Uh, we have uh, as well rings and uh, the cut cam a possibility with the uh, bone builder. As the example, this is the second stage surgery where I make the re-entry and you can see the healing of the block which was a uh, sponges with the cortical layer on top and what I experienced that over the um, time after approximately six months we still have a um, very uh, rigid and, and very uh, stable area uh, of the cortical uh, la layer, and it needs a little bit more time. Sometimes I even take a burr and I smoothen it, I make it a little bit thinner uh, to, to bring a little bit faster uh, nutrition to this area. But it heals very nicely and we get really very nice result. As well, we use from the uh, allografts the plate, which we will use to bring this kind of resistance walls because we want to uh, build up the area which will uh, protect the 
augmented area or regenerated area from the tension, from the tension of the muscles, from the tension uh, coming from the foot, from the, uh, uh, any pressure which can limit or um, make a distribution of the material, especially granulated materials. So with this type of construction, we build um, a kind of resistance wall, which uh, next serves as the support for the tissue. And then we fill this area with the particles of bone. And what I want to show you, how quickly we can build with this granulated layer, which fills this um, um, inner side, how quickly we can build the bone. Because this picture which you see, the difference in between these two pictures is only three months. This area was completely filled with granulated allograft, so we can uh, even not recognize where is the implant. We still see uh, the screws which hold the, um, which holds the, uh, the cortical plate, but there is perfect integration, perfect remodeling of the uh, bone. Uh, so of course, we use as well not only allograft, we use also synthetic materials and as well um, uh, xenografts. Synthetic materials, uh, in opinion of, of many practitioners and scientists, um, are the future of uh, guided bone regeneration. Uh, because it's much easier to control uh, the production and as well load them in the future with some drugs like uh, the antibiotics and maybe uh, with some uh, proteins uh, like BMPs uh, to get better results. This is an example of um, the re-entry of the uh, area which was uh, with uh, uh, previously done um, apicoectomy, which was not actually um, uh, positive with the positive response from the tissue. We had some problems. We experienced these problems um, uh, with uh, bad healing inside with the granulation tissue. But the problem, main problem was that uh, the uh, treatment of the um, roots, the canal treatment was not the best quality, so there was still the infection coming in. But uh, this is not the case to show you all the step-by-step -step procedures. What I want to share you the behavior of the material, because when the area was cleaned and the um, apicoectomy wa was um, performed once again, the area was rinsed with the metronidazole solution, and I filled this space with um, uh, the particles of max resort. This is the synthetic material, which I uh, explained uh, on the beginning of the lecture, but I was really, really surprised with the results after nine months when I had the chance to compare to these two uh, slides uh, with uh, CBCT, with computed tomography cross-sections. On the beginning, before we started, you can see the big defect in the bone, in the maxilla, and you can clearly recognize this cortical layer which surrounds the defect. This is the sign uh, um, which shows that there is a kind of response from the bone to create uh, this kind of barrier from the inflammatory region. When we filled this area, when we rinsed up this area with metronidazole, later on it was filled up with this max resorb, and you can see here the result after 9-10 months. What you can clearly recognize that there is no left area after this cortical uh, demarcation, uh, uh, after this cortical barrier, which was initially. So it proves, it shows that within these uh, months, uh, the remodeling process, which was initiated immediately after surgery, um, brought a perfect integration of the material. Even the quality of this material, when you look closer, it's really hard to recognize where the material was placed. So this is very good sign how this material behaves in the tissue. Also, we have um, another group of materials in use. It means xenografts, and xenografts we use very often to keep the volume of the regenerated area. Like in this case, where we have a very big defect, and with the tent technique or with the screw technique, we can create some kind of uh, protection, kind of roof, which supports um, um, the area, which will create kind of uh, outer layer 
uh, which will protect underneath the biomaterial from the replacement. But what is very important for me that when I place the particles of cerebon, in this case this is mixed with uh, PRF uh, particles, uh, that when we will place it inside of the area, we will create after the completed when after this process will uh, co will be completed we will create very stable and very resistant for resorption area which will give us very good support for implant installation especially when we compare the x-ray from uh, the initial situation where we were planning the implant installation and the area after uh, the uh, rest, uh, regeneration um, it, it took place. We can see how much of the volume we were able uh, to build. So after six months from the first surgery we make a re-entry and what is uh, very very clear and what we can uh, very easily see that all the material which was uh, placed over this tent, over the screws, is not anymore in place, but everything which is underneath the screws and everything which is uh, below uh, the, the tent is perfectly integrated with very nice quality. So this is the base for implant installation and the regeneration. What is also very characteristic when we work with xenografts that sometimes the particles of the biomaterials, which I point here with this green arrow, we can be rejected or they are not integrated with 100% volume and some of the particles from the uh, surface can be later on removed through the soft tissue. When we see this kind of uh, small areas then we just remove it with the probe but we do not open it completely because we do not want to expose uh, the bone to not initiate osteoclastic activity. What we can do to improve the healing of the bone? One of the methods is of course material technique, but also we can add some kind of um, biological activity by using, for instance, platelet-rich fibrin, which is very popular nowadays. Of course, we have few different technologies and techniques uh, which can give us this platelet-rich um, uh, plasma or platelet-rich there is growth factors. Uh, so uh, we have at least 10 different protocols, but what is in common of all of these protocols that we want to add to the material, to the regeneration area, some growth factors, some um, proteins which will stimulate uh, the ingrowth of new vessels especially. We do not expect suddenly then we will have uh, a big amount of uh, osteoblast or uh, bone morphogenetic proteins. By uh, using this um, uh, platelet-rich uh, fibrin, we want to place inside of the wound the big concentration of platelets and, and also the leukocytes. Because inside of this um, fibrin, we will have the full volume from this full volume of blood which was, um, uh, which was taken we will have 100% uh, of the platelets and also from 50 to 65% of the leukocytes which have a lot of growth factors uh, which can stimulate especially um, uh, angiogenesis. And with these membranes we can make different types of uh, um, procedures. And uh, with uh, bone regeneration, we are using this uh, fibrin as, uh, to, to create membranes. This is one um, uh, one type of uh, work with this with this uh, clots. And also, we can create it in the particulated form and as well as the as, um, kind of corks. When we use the special boxes with these membranes, we can add them in the wound for better healing, to improvement of the better healing. We can 
particulate them to the smaller pieces to add it into the material, but also we use the exudate, uh, which is um, um, collected in the bottom of the special box, because inside of this exudate we will have a lot of um, um, adhesive proteins, which are like vibronectin and uh, fibronectin, which are um, very important to get the contact in between the cells and uh, the biomaterial in, uh, in between the bone and as well in between implant surface. So it is nice to have as well this material or this technology um, as your um, element, also as your site, um, which will help you to get better results. Techniques, what kind of techniques? I mean, what kind of um, barriers we can build to get uh, better results? Uh, we can have, um, uh, for instance, plates, we can have the membranes, we can have the screws, but our goal is to um, control horizontal volume and as well vertical volume. It is related not only to the bone, but also to the soft tissue. When we are able to control, push, how the soft tissue will push on the material which is underneath or will pull by uh, uh, ligaments or some attachments uh, and it will create the tension within the incision line. Every type of uh, this type of tension can ruin or um, in influence negatively the result of the healing. That's why it is very important to uh, not only uh, master the technology in the meaning of the materials which we are using but also to know what we can use, what we can adapt to build this outer layer. And we can use screws with this uh, type of um, titanium bars, we can use the plates, and as well we have some specific titanium membranes as well uh, to control this tension. As, also, as a technology uh, to create, to prepare, um, to make our life easier, uh, we can use the most advanced technique where we can create uh, the volume of the block in the CAD CAM technology with the help of the computer-guided um, uh, tomography. Uh, based on uh, the information from the computer tomography, uh, there will be uh, in the computer created model of the uh, block which will fit exactly to the uh, defect which is um, in the patient's mouth. It is also very interesting that now uh, BOTIS is offering us this called MaxGraph Bone Builder Dummy. So this is this kind of individual uh, model, uh, 3D printed uh, from, from plastic, uh, where we can um, um, order it additionally, not only as a uh, MaxGraph Bone Builder, but also this dummy to show to the patient, to explain also to other patients uh, what is uh, the procedure, how it will look like, and um, uh, even we can later on, when we have this plastic model, we can plan exactly where to position our screws before we start the surgery. Because of a big demand from the market, now we have to wait for a bone builder even 10 weeks. But based on the uh, information uh, from, from the bodies, um, they want to improve and uh, speed up uh, the, the process of the uh, production, but uh, the demand shows how much, how many patients are waiting for this technology to shorten the time of the treatment. Because when we have this type of block ready, then our procedure is much faster because uh, we can be focused on the soft tissue management where we have the perfect fit of the, of the block and we can select uh, the technique how to open our flap, how we would like to manage with the soft tissue to cover the defect and have the time of the procedure shorter approximately 50%. So there is a plenty of benefits for the patient, but of course the price is also the issue. But of course you, got, you, you are getting what you pay for. The technology is worth of it, but of course let's uh, give the patient uh, the chance to decide what they want. 
if my patients uh, are limited with the budget, I want to apply or use different type of techniques. Not only bone builder, of course, we have, for instance, the screw techniques. I will show you a few cases where I have very nice result with these techniques. First case which I show, this is the case where you see a quite big horizontal defect and during the planning stage, uh, especially in the mandible, it's very common that within the uh, few months and especially few years after the extraction, we can have the massive uh, bone reduction, especially in the horizontal uh, plane. And you can see how much volume of the bone should be created to bring back the uh, level or um, volume of the bone which was initially when patient had his own natural teeth. We can see the plan of the two implants and this red line shows the optimum position of the wall of the uh, bone. After two implants installation in the optimum position from the prosthetic point of view, we see the exposure of the surface of the implant on the um, um, labial of this um, uh, on the on this uh, uh, lateral side on this uh, buccal wall, and we would like to build the volume of the bone how we can do it. This is the example with the use of the TLB fast system. This is the system which has this kind of uh, titanium bar with the loops and the screws and of course you can use any different type of the titanium bar for um, for instance uh, for um, bones, uh, bone synthesis materials but the goal uh, of this uh, presentation is to show you the concept because this bar serves as the support, as the ceiling for the material which will be underneath. So we place underneath the mixture of the material. In this case, this is 50% of the allograft and 50% of the cerabone. Because when you have the more challenging situation, then the more we add autogenous bone or allograft in the mixture with the cerabone. You can see also here uh, not only material, but also you can see the membrane. This is um, the collagen membrane, Jason. This is pericardium membrane, which has a prolonged stability. And on top, I placed a few layers of the PRF membrane. PRF membrane does not replace a collagen membrane because PRF membrane, this is the uh, fibrin membrane which, is the, um, which serves as the um, donor, as the um, place where these platelets with growth factors are sitting inside. But after one week actually, uh, it will uh, not be any more uh, stable and it will not be any more visible here. But the membrane, collagen membrane, serves mostly as a barrier membrane for at least another um, three to six months, depends the origin of the collagen membrane. After the suturing, here with, with the PTFE sutures, with these Goretex sutures, uh, we have um, the next slide which shows some small perforation which can occur. And this is the situation after four months from the uh, um, surgery. This is the moment where we have to uh, remove this bar, when we have to make the second stage surgery. And when I open this area, what you can see in the area where we have this uh, fenestration, the perforation, we, you see, can see some infiltration of the tissue, uh, say of the soft tissue. You see some holes after the screws which were, which were placed. But what is really very nice, we can see the volume of the bone which was created this, um, let's say, uh, kind of hybrid volume which is created. Uh, I place the covering healing screw as well with the PRF membrane and sutures. But what is very important to see the x-rays, to see the volume which is created next to the implants, especially when I compare the x-ray, the cross-section from the CBCT, from the planning um, a phase where you can see uh, this um, uh, slope uh, of the bone where we can see the missing volume and this is the same um, uh, size of the implant this is 3.5 millimeter in diameter implant 
ankylos where you can see the volume of the bone which was created and let's take a look with the second implant as well nice volume which is created the goal is to create the width of the bone around an implant because this is the uh, one of the principles which will uh, create stability long-term stability of the implant the bone and as well soft tissue volume. Another type of support which we can give is with this uh, type of uh, titanium membranes and this is also a very interesting option and what is nice it's quite easy to do. It's not a very challenging how to fix this bone. After preparation of the bone uh, to install an implant you see some uh, decortication some additional holes to improve some nutrition the implant was placed one millimeter below the crest because this is the um, um, normal way how we place the ankylos implant and on top we place additional special um, um, abutment uh, with one millimeter collar height. There are available also with two millimeters depending the structure and depending the uh, size of the um, defect. And this is the element which will serve us as a base to screw on top the membrane because the membrane will be fixed to the implant. Before the uh, implant, uh, before membrane installation, I fill the area with the uh, mixture, super power mix, as I call it, because this is the mixture of 50% of cerabone, 50% of allograft or autogenous bone particles, and this is mixed as well with one particulated membrane from PRF. And sometimes when we have some inflammatory process, we can add some metronidazole in powder, approximately 125 milligram for this volume I would add. Then I place this membrane. This membrane consists from the very thin titanium, uh, pre-shaped, um, um, uh, it comes in pre-shaped uh, form. and. We have different type of screws to connect it to this special abutment. So you see this membrane in place with the screw which fix uh, the membrane on top. And it adopts very nicely. We have different sizes because you can have as well um, the, the membranes which are wider. We, they can also um, uh, have the additional overlap to the lingual area. So you can trim them, you can cut them. So it is also very nice op option. The same procedure, membrane, collagen membrane on top, the PRF membrane, and this is uh, the way how we work uh, finishing with the suture material. But when we make the X-ray, what we can see very nicely uh, comparing to the initial stage, initial phase of the uh, planning, we can find and see very, very thin this outer layer of the regenerated area. This is this membrane, this eigen membrane. We can see the implant. This is the level of the implant here. But on top, you can see additional this one millimeter um, uh, abutment for fixing membrane and on top the fixing screw. And very nice, very clear, visible the volume of the uh, uh, augmented area. In challenging cases, we sometimes have to make the decision, sometimes very hard decisions, what we want to do, what we want to achieve. In the cases where we have two implants next to each other or two teeth with the defects like this, we have to make the decision when we want to extract the tooth. Is it the extraction of the one tooth or two teeth in the same time? Um, how to proceed with the patient where you see the inflammatory um, uh, tissue, where you can expect that there is active inflammation? How to treat this patient, especially when you have high aesthetic risk? Because uh, with this patient, all the uh, um, defect which will be visible in the soft tissue immediately will be recognized and visible also uh, with, uh, in the smile. So with these challenging cases, uh, it's hard to predict where the tissue finally will end up. And this we have to discuss every time with our patient. On the planning phase, we tried to find um, the uh, possibilities, how to augment the area, where to place and how to place an implant. I like very much to place, um, uh, to install um, implants immediately after uh, tooth extraction. But when we have 
active inflammatory phase, it is high risk. That's why we have to decide when to place an implant after tooth extraction and how we can accelerate the process and how we can keep the volume of the tissue. In this specific case, we um, discussed with the patient, uh, something has stopped uh, with my presentation for a moment. I'm sorry, I have to bring back the presentation because I don't see it anymore. I see share my screen and upload is in progress. Okay, now it will bring, it will be brought back. Okay, some technical issues, but probably this is because of me, not because of uh, uh, great uh, support from the uh, Dental Tribune. <laughs> so I am sorry for this, but uh, within a few uh, seconds I will find my uh, slides uh, which I want to share with you. Yes, we are uh, close to this uh, case which I show. Okay, you can see what I did. Okay, we um, end up with these slides. So uh, I discussed with the patient that um, we will extract the tooth and we will make all the treatment in stages because I want to avoid the situation that suddenly um, we will have no control about what is happening with the tissue. The original plan was to extract these two teeth because of internal resorption. You can see the tooth after extraction with the huge resorption inside and uh, the bone defect which was visible on the x-ray. So after the extraction um, we also removed the crown from the lateral incisor because we wanted to extract one tooth in one time and this tooth will serve us as the support for the temporary restoration because with the tooth number 22 we will create uh, the uh, some crown with the pontic uh, supported on the um, central incisor. So we clean the area and to speed up, to accelerate the process of healing, I place the PRF as a kind of cork. We create the corks inside of these special boxes because this PRF inside will promote clot formation and as well will promote uh, the process of uh, inflammatory phase. Inside we have plenty of platelets and as well leukocytes and inside of such a, um, alveolus we can place even three corks like this. This is uh, the cork which is um, uh, which comes from approximately 9 to 10 milliliters of the blood. So this is the number of blood which we place inside comes from 20 to 30 milliliters of the blood. So it's, it's massive, massive amount of the growth factors, massive amounts of the proteins which will support uh, the process of clot formation and the healing. So uh, after that I place the temporal restoration which is the crown with the pontic and you can see over the pontic. This ovate pontic, it's very important because it has to go deep inside, inside the uh, socket on, on the depth of 3 millimeters. It's very important because it will give the support for the tissue on the vestibulum and as well it will give the support for the papillas. And my goal is to inform the patient uh, that we will observe what will happen with this reddish papilla because if the bone will be present next to the lateral incisor, this reddish uh, color will disappear and the papilla will stay in place. If not, reddish color will disappear and the papilla will disappear as well. I leave a little bit PRF on the outside surface of the socket because it will stimulate as well a little bit proliferation of the epithelium on the uh, surface. Uh, so after the process of healing has, has started, we can see the picture after a few weeks, very nice color of helix, no reddish uh, color signs of inflammation, but we can clearly see the defect, the missing papilla. It shows that for sure we will have the problem and the defect of the volume of the height of the, of the bone uh, supporting the papilla. Immediately after the uh, removal of the uh, temporal restoration, we see the size of the defect and our goal is to create in the first stage to build the volume of the bone before implant placement. So after the opening, this is uh, in between the weeks 6 
uh, to 8 from the extraction, you can see the process of healing has started and we see some big volume of the uh, soft tissue and the granulation tissue and after cleaning of the area we see also quite big defect. Also, you can notice uh, quite big exposure of the surface of the root and the big defect over here, which is the, um, the reason why we do not uh, uh, see or we do not have the papilla in place while we experience that this papilla uh, disappears. So another shot shows as well the technique of the soft tissue management because you can realize that this is split flap technique. You can see the two layers, external layer and internal layer. This is the periosteum. You can see this is detached from the bone level and as well the split incision in between the outer layer of the uh, mucogingival flap and as well uh, the um, uh, periosteum inside. This is the uh, technique which helps me uh, to elongate the flap and close um, later on it without any tension. This is the uh, cortical strut which I used uh, originally and it was um, uh, not available commercially yet but now uh, from, from then this week um, or next week it will be available with the name of Max Graft Cortico which is much better from this one which I, which I used because this is uh, which will be available it is already one millimeter in thickness this one which I uh, used was 1.5 to 2 millimeters and I had to make um, um, the technique uh, to divide these uh, cortical uh, struts. So how I was doing it, you can see that this plate uh, was almost two millimeters thick. So I used um, uh, the uh, forceps. These are forceps uh, which were um, uh, designed by Professor Nenfik. They are coming from uh, Ustomet company and I used um, the um, uh, special uh, um, uh, disc. Uh, this is a disc used by dental technicians for um, uh, separation of the casts. So uh, you can buy such a disc and have it to use it with your uh, straight uh, handpiece uh, to have for this type of procedure. So you can see that I can have I can uh, have, have very nice incision uh, dividing line uh, but you have to be very pr uh, precise you have to use this kind of forceps uh, to protect your very precious fingers so I created two very thin layers of the plates and uh, you will have this max graph cortico now available and I create uh, like a box I create the um, um, roof, the ceiling, the ceiling, and I fix it with the one screw, long screw, which is one millimeter in diameter and uh, 16 to 18 millimeter long. And you can see that I build the support when I support on the one side on the bone, but on the opposite side, I make a support on the level of the tooth. Because I want to create, I wanted to make a try, and it was uh, negotiated with the patient as well. We discussed it that let's give a try. Let's try to build the bone before we will make the extraction of this tooth. Because it would be much better to create the volume and maybe we will be able also as well to build up the bone here that maybe at the end we will place only one implant and we will still be able to protect this um, uh, tooth uh, lateral one. The area was filled with a uh, cortical, uh, with the sponges uh, bone, with the uh, granulate, sponges granulates from Max Graft mixed with the PRF, and the surface was covered, was closed like a box, like a door, with another plate which was initially divided uh, from the first uh, layer. Then, after the fixation with these screws, uh, we, uh, I took this um, piezosurgical tool to make a smooth um, um, ridges uh, to avoid these sharp edges uh, because we want to avoid any sharp area which can irritate the soft tissue which can be the reason of the perforation. This is also very, very important. Then on top I placed the um, collagen membrane. This is Jason pericardium membrane and then few layers of the PRF membranes as well to promote the healing, to promote the nutrition, to promote the vascularization because no vascularization, no good healing. Tension-free flap adaptation with the sutures uh, from the Goretex. Then you can see the advanced, uh, cord uh, coronally advanced flap. So I want to have this volume and 
patient was sent home for healing. After six months, we decided to make the implantation. And you can see here, this is the planning stage, the planning phase before the surgery. You can see the initial uh, picture with the uh, tooth still present and the moment where we can see the long screw which was used to fix the, um, the top plate and the volume of the ridge which we were able to create in a very nice way in the axis of the future crown. This is the volume, how it looks from the incisal side, so very nice soft tissue appearance. From front we can see that still the papilla is not perfectly in place and I cannot predict and I cannot um, actually promise the patient that we will have perfectly papilla in place, but we do our best. After in the second stage surgery, when we open it, we can experience and see very nice healing, very nice adaptation of the uh, tissue. We can make the re-entry re uh, uh, after four months. And what you can see here, I took additionally the with the trephine the biopsy. The biopsy, and at the end I will show you the histology as well of this case, because thanks to the bodies I was able as well to make the histology of this case. And during the process of the uh, working with the trephine, I destroyed a little bit connection of this top layer of this cortical plate, which you, I can show you uh, that uh, during the process of the drilling, I detached, I destroyed this connection. but. Because of this, I was able to document amazing result what happens underneath below. What you can see here, it's amazing nutrition in the area which was filled completely with the granules, with the um, uh, uh, particulated allograft, where we can have these max graft um, uh, particles integrated in the bone during the process of the resorption and remodeling. Very nice vessels and very nice level of the bone next to the tooth. And I was really surprised with this picture and especially when we compare the initial picture and the picture after the removal of this plate, you can see how much volume is created and I cannot tell you what kind of tissue is it. It was hard. And what kind of uh, connection is with the uh, uh, surface of the tooth? I have no idea because I have no cross-section, I have no histology, but it looks very promising. And uh, with this information, with these uh, conditions, I could place an implant in the optimum position. And this was the uh, before uh, reconstruction with the bone regeneration and after implant installation. Implant was placed perfectly in place in the aesthetic window, so this is quite promising uh, situation to build up very nice crown. And the process of, the, of this case is not finished. Patient is still during the healing phase. Um, we, do not, um, we didn't make uh, the final restoration with the final crown yet, but after the surgery, we placed, of course, uh, some additional layers of the PRF membranes to improve healing. Some very nice uh, suturing and flap adaptation without any um, tension. So it is the must to have. But at the end, uh, we got, uh, after uh, two months, um, uh, very nice uh, results uh, from the histology. And uh, we can see on this histological picture, um, a very nice uh, area with the uh, max graft, uh, the lamellar bone elements visible, but also new bone formation, where we can see vital osteocytes, which are present in between the particles of the bone bone powder. So this is the proof that the process of um, resorption and remodeling takes very nice place. This is the uh, picture uh, from the healing phase and I cannot now share with you the final pictures but of course whenever I will have the chance and possibility I would like to share it with you.
And as the last case in this webinar, I would like also to show you some kind of very challenging cases uh, which are um, related to the exposed implants. I was um, that uh, I got a patient which was referred to me with such a situation where after three years from implant installations, um, it was the big uh, defect, vertical defect, the massive resorption of the bone around three implants, and the doctor uh, did a lot of work to um, uh, trying to solve the problem. Uh, it, there was um, the, the prosthetic reconstruction already done, but because of inflammation, it was few, a few times removed, some additional work with uh, soft tissue augmentation, nothing helped. And you can notice uh, one implant which is exposed, and in two places some areas with reddish color where the fistulas uh, are from time to time active. So after the opening of the area, as, uh, we decided actually to explant three implants, to remove all of them and to prepare to start to build up the bone. But um, when I took a look inside of this area, I decided to remove this implant, uh, this in the middle, and this distal one, I decided to leave because I wanted to try to fight uh, with this implant and try to build later on bone next to the exposed implant, which was actually uh, um, with some kind of inflammation, which, which was uh, contaminated. When the implant is very well uh, integrated, it's uh, very hard to remove it even if we have dedicated instruments, and especially when it is in the mandible, in the cortical layer. That's why we had to remove this uh, implant with the use of the piezo surgery, and we can see how big the defect was created. Because I want to install implant as fast as I can, then I use so-called short-term socket management, because this is like the um, post-extraction socket management. And in these cases, I use only collagen or PRF to promote the natural bone healing. Because when I place the collagen or PRF, I can enter the same place after only three months and almost the area will be healed with the bone. If I would place here material like Cerabone or Max Resorb or any biomaterial, I could install implant in this area after six, seven months earliest. So we have to know what kind of type, what type of material we want to use to promote the healing. So I left this area for three months because I wanted to have natural, a nice bone healing and look what happened after three months. Nice healing in this area where the implant was exposed, where there was one fistula, but you can notice still uh, remaining fistula here. Why? Because I forgot to replace uh, the uh, old inflammated or um, uh, infected uh, cover screw with the new one. So that's why I decided still to keep this play, at the, you know, to hold this implant and replace only with the new sterile um, um, closing screw. You can see the improvement of the bone healing, but because of the size of the defect, it was much bigger than the natural root, you still see that this defect is not completely closed, but you can see big advantage of the natural bone healing because the volume of the defect is really reduced. And it was enough that we could place an implant. The implant, when we place, we also rehydrate the surface of the implant with the exudate from the PRF because it has a lot of um, these uh, adhesive proteins which will stimulate or which will promote the contact of the cells with the surface of the implant. So in place, um, in the position or in the defect, we place two new implants, one and a second. And this is the old implant which was infected and we replaced only with the new uh, covering screw. Before we completed uh, the uh, surgical procedure, the surface of this implant was treated with the doxycycline. Doxycycline, um, I use it from the capsule and I mix it with the saline solution and I make a, a kind of a mix which I apply on the surface of the implant and I leave it for two, three minutes. Uh, two, three minutes. And this is the protocol of um, uh, Professor Sato uh, from periodontology, which you can uh, adopt as well, uh, treating the surface 
of the implant. You can use uh, some of the uh, authors use also 35% uh, uh, phosphoric acid, which is used also in the um, um, uh, restorative uh, or uh, general dentistry, uh, so you can also use this acid as well uh, to remove some proteins from the surface of the implant. What I did next, next I built up the tent, I built up the roof and for this reason I used these bars, these titanium bars, which are fixed with the few screws to hold this tent in the distance from the, uh, from the bone, from the implants. And next, I filled the space in between the bone and in between the top of this uh, roof with the super power mix. So it is the mixture of 50% of the cerabone, 50% of the allograft or autogenous bone, particulated membrane from PRF, and you can add as well metronidazole to uh, control uh, bacteria. Then everything will be covered with this, peri with this uh, pericardium membrane, collagen membrane. This is the Jason membrane. And you can see there are two layers, one and two, of this membrane because I want to protect this area from the exposure. On top, I place additionally few layers of the PRF membranes. And I make the sutures, tension-free sutures, but it is also very important to control this tension. So you, at the end of this type of surgery, you have to make pull test. So you have to pull the lower lip uh, to the side and you can immediately realize that here we can see some kind of tension. This tension, this pull, will create a tension in the incision line. So this is the weakest point in this area, which can be the reason of the perforation or the exposure of the regenerated area. How we can control it? We can place the mattress suture here, but in the lower uh, jaw, in the mandible, sometimes in this area, in these defects, uh, the apical mattress sutures can be quite difficult uh, to, uh, to place and to establish the rigid or um, stable um, protection. The second option is, I do not see my screen one more time, I place something, could you help me with the presentation to bring it back, it would be beneficial. I am, I am pressing from time to time by accident my space bar and this is the reason why it happens. So I am sorry, as I am not used to this uh, setup, that's why um, you have to forgive me this. I am coming back. Okay, this is not the case. Ah, uh, you see now, it happened, yeah, okay, okay, is it, yeah, 61, it should be here, okay, so, uh, our last um, slide was uh, with the uh, situation where I explained to you this pull syndrome in this premolar area. The solution uh, to avoid this pull syndrome is to um, give this kind of uh, superficial uh, soft tissue incision and immediately you can see how much this tension was pulling the tissue. So uh, I leave it um, in this area for the secondary uh, healing, open healing. So after two weeks, you can see very nice epithelialization of this, uh, of this area. It can be a little bit painful for the patient, but it is worth to uh, make this incision to get the best um, uh, results to protect this area. So you can see very nice healing after two weeks. And this is the situation after six months. And I would like to pay your attention especially to the area of the uh, soft tissue, the quality of the soft tissue. Look how wide the ridge is and look the quality of the uh, soft tissue. When I compare, when I take a closer look, this is uh, the soft tissue which is keratinized. This is uh, not mobile tissue. And uh, this is the reason why it happens because we build up the 
very nice support for the tissue. This is the uh, reason why uh, we do have to create a volume, vertical and horizontal volume of the ridge to have stable soft tissue. If the volume will be not created, the soft tissue will have the problems uh, with the uh, function and the, the volume because it will be much more uh, mobile tissue uh, on the top of the ridge. So you can see after six months uh, the difference in the height of the um, uh, volume of the, of the ridge before the treatment and after the surgery and as well compare these sites. This is the initial situation where we have the exposed implants and uh, a lot of mobile tissue and look how nicely this area looks after the surgery with the proper volume where we have the nice support for the tissue. After opening of the area, this is something which makes the impression it was like for me like a Christmas gift actually because when I was so excited when I opened this area that uh, I, I I really was was happy like a kid uh, who got a very nice present like a best car because um, uh, to experience such a nice um, uh, vertical volume uh, regeneration it's really something um, uh, what 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 is what is really uh, which which makes me um, very happy. So I see these two bars with steel screws visible, but when I remove these screws, where are my implants? There are three implants underneath. This is the initial picture before, and this is the after the opening and removal of this bar. This is very hard and solid structure, and I had to use the burr to open the implants. And you know what? These two implants, they were new implants coming from the package, but this implant was infected. So with this technique, with this approach, with this biological approach, with the use as well of the PRF, we were able to build the bone next to the exposed and infected implant actually. And this is something uh, which is uh, for me also important to plan in a di different way how I look as well on my cases or the cases which I have to treat uh, which are referred to my office. And uh, what I experienced as well with the x-rays, it was also something very interesting, especially when you look at the CBCT and the cross-sections, because this volume which is visible on the vestibular side. This is the volume which is built. This is short implant. This is 8 millimeter implant. In such a cases, what kind of options we have for the patient? We, of course, we can go with lateralization of the mandibular nerve, but the risk which is um, uh, with this uh, type of procedures uh, for my patients in majority is too high. And I don't feel comfortable with this type of procedures. So I would like to have the predictable type of um, uh, procedures which will allow me to build the volume of the bone next to the implants. So here um, uh, you can see on the cross-section the implant, this is exactly this implant in the position of uh, premolar, which you can see how much it was exposed. And you can see the length, this is 8 millimeter implant, and this is the volume which was built. This is the volume which was created. So you can imagine what kind of possibilities we have if we apply correct materials and correct techniques to get such a nice results. So I hope that um, uh, this information which I shared with you um, is, uh, makes you, uh, brings you some questions as well and uh, I hope it will give you some ideas and I am happy and very thankful that I could share with you uh, my experience. And of course it needs uh, more cases to be done and it needs more um, uh, very thorough studies, scientific studies as well, to get more and more data uh, to have the predictable, um, uh, um, let's say, guidelines which will help us to get the best results. But what is really great that this technology exists and it gives us really uh, powerful tools uh, to help our patients.
Uh, I see uh, here is the moment for uh, the, the, the questions um, this, uh, and I see some questions coming uh, from, from the colleagues. Uh, thank you very much and uh, I am also very glad uh, to see some of my friends. Uh, so I say hello uh, to all uh, whom I know and uh, to all of new friends. And uh, here is the first question from Dr. Roman Maslov. Uh, what mold uh, do you usually use to your centrifuge, EBA, for making PRF? Okay, uh, so what kind of settings uh, do I use? Actually, I was using two types of settings. I was using the settings from Dr. Joseph Chokrun from APRF, and it was for EBA centrifuge initially uh, 1,500 um, rounds per minute uh, and uh, eight minutes with the last settings. But I had, uh, to be honest, um, a little bit problems to get a good quality of the clot. And then I made uh, um, a step back to the initial settings from the LPRF, this LucasArts PRF, um, uh, which is uh, now I am working mostly, which is 2,800 rounds per minute and 12 minutes. And in majority, the quality of the clot is much, much better. Uh, when you go with this protocol from uh, coming from the Dr. Joseph Chokrun, uh, if you experience low quality of the PRF, then you have to open the tubes and leave it for a few minutes more and wait uh, for uh, the clot formation. If not, please try go to uh, with this um, uh, p uh, with these settings 2800 rpm and 12 minutes this is the setting which i use now how many days uh, that membranes uh, biodegrade? Uh, it resorbs within the first, actually, week because uh, from the studies we know that uh, this membrane serves, uh, this um, fibrin membrane is uh, as the layer which is um, uh, uh, as, um, a place where this. Um, cells like platelets are trapped and this is like a, a plate which gives these uh, cells to the area, to the uh, surrounding and, uh, and the, the fibrin um, uh, clot will uh, be degraded within the first week, uh, first two weeks maximum and so it is not the membrane which, which you can use as a um, barrier membrane. Here I have the question from uh, Dr. Mahmoud Barakat. I hope I pronounce it correctly. How bone graft material affects the quality of the bone regeneration process? And what is your recommendation to have good quality that has long-term stability? Very good question. Thank you for this question. And um, uh, I have also the same concerns. What kind of uh, mixture uh, I should use? My answer is based on the clinical trials and as well on the scientific findings. We know it that the best results are when we mix 50% of the allograft or autogenous bone with 50% of the cerebone because the cerebone gives the volume stability. The autogenous bone or allograft gives the speed of the bone regeneration. And when you have the mixture in such a proportion, you can enter with the second stage surgery after four to five months. If you have more challenging cases, then you should mix or add more autogenous bone or more allograft and reduce the volume of the uh, artificial material. It doesn't matter, it will be synthetic or it will be uh, uh, xenograft. So in these cases we even give 80% of the autogenous bone or allograft and reduce the volume of cerebone to 20%. And as well, it's very important and very crucial for me to add PRF particles to stimulate, to promote vessels formation. The next question I have from um, Yvonne Enough, or Enough, I'm sorry if I pronounce it uh, not correctly. Can I have the same result by mixing bone graft material with patient bone? Yes, of course. Uh, by mixing bone graft material, this is, I, I hope you mean, uh, for instance, cerebone or um, max, max resorb. So this is uh, synthetic material or, or, or xenograft. Yes, you can even get better results um, because when you have the autogenous bone, the mixture of autogenous bone have more cells, living cells, and as well um, the, the number of uh, proteins can be higher. So if you do not have allograft, please use 
uh, the chips of the bone. You can harvest with the drills or with the special trephines, and you can um, make it uh, in the granulate uh, form. The next uh, question is coming from Dr. Giovanni uh, Ballarani. What about nanogenerated bone graft substitute in paste, please? Uh, I have no uh, actually experience uh, with nanogenerated bone graft substitute uh, because um, I, I didn't work, I didn't have the chance uh, to work with such a, a substitute, so I cannot answer uh, with, with, uh, with my um, um, experience uh, for these questions. I am sorry for this, but if you have some experience, please um, uh, try to share with us, uh, because uh, it's also very important to know different materials and the behavior. Uh, I see also uh, the question coming from the anonymous member. Can you mention the importance of the occlusal adjustment and the bone graft success? Uh, occlusal adjustment. Uh, I do not understand fully uh, your question uh, about the occlusal adjustment. If you mean uh, the, the proper um, occlusal surfaces and occlusal um, uh, some, uh, reconstruction from the crown, uh, because uh, of course if you mean the loading of the graft, it's also very, very important because uh, especially as uh, the, the, the problem can happen with the augmented area which is not loaded in correct time, especially in the, if the graft was coming only from the autologous or allograft. Uh, we uh, know it from the science, uh, there are some very nice articles and as well documenting beautiful, beautiful uh, histological findings, the behavior of the bone next to the implants which were not loaded properly and not loaded at all. If this happens, the bone will disappear if it has no reinforcement, for instance, with the xenograft, because bone will stay only in the area which is loaded, otherwise will be resorbed. There is kind of, uh, there is um, um, such a a theory, a mechanostatic theory, which says that osteocytes, the cells in the bone, they have the sense or, or they can recognize the load of the bone. And if the bone is not loaded, it will lose the volume, it will lose the quality of the trabeculas and the quality of the um, structure. So it's also very, very important, very good question and a very good point that we have to as well control the load of the bone. But when the bone is very fresh and very fragile, when it is uh, in the first moment after the regeneration, we have to as well think about a trans transitional phase, which is with the proper loading, and we can apply so-called um, uh, bone training. This is the uh, protocol, for instance, coming from the uh, University, uh, Frankfurt University, uh, where uh, we have this protocol called um, um, uh, bone training, where after the uh, final restoration is um, applied, where after final restoration delivery, a uh, patient is um, um, using only soft diet for the first six weeks to um, slowly improve the quality, the um, loading of the bone. Uh, I have another question as well here. It is, uh, it is the influence of the quality of the regeneration if it leaves a small portion of the exposed membrane. Uh, so the question is related to the exposure of the membrane. Of course, it's um, a very critical um, uh, where we see uh, the exposure of the membrane, especially collagen membrane. Why? We have to try to create the surgery make a um, uh, flap um, um, management in a way that the membrane is fully closed. But it can happen because of tension, because of uh, accidental uh, trauma, that the membrane will be exposed. And what can happen then? If the membrane is exposed, it will resorb much quicker compared to the moment where it is closed. Why it happens? Because in the mouth we have the enzymes uh, like collagen, collagenase and elastase which will um, uh, create much quicker resorption of the membrane. If we see some tension in the flap, please 
place few layers of the membrane in the area of the top or the in the incision line. In case you will have the opening of the uh, flap in this area, you have better or higher chance that the soft tissue will proliferate on top of the um, of the of the uh, membrane uh, before it will be completely resorbed. So this is the moment where you have to apply this kind of emergency protocol, where you have to rinse the area uh, with uh, chlorhexidine, where you have to uh, give to the patient chlorhexidine gel to apply this gel uh, like a topical um, uh, on the on the surface because it is really very important to control uh, this area. Uh, next, um, from Hector Nero, congratulations for your lecture. Thank you very much, Hector, and, and uh, it's a very good pictures. Uh, uh, photography is, 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 my, is my love, is my hobby, so uh, I really, really appreciate and I really love to share um, what I really, really love. Uh, Mikhail, uh, Mikhail Kozlov, Chris, which materials do you use in sinus augmentation? Thanks. In sinus, I use mixture. I use mixture of... I use for sure PRF and membranes of PRF I use in direct contra contact with the collagen um, in the with Schneiderian membrane and as well I use uh, this uh, collagen sponge, uh, this Jason fleece, where I place this fleece, this collagen sponge um, uh, in the corners or in the most distal or mesial area just to give the support for the membrane. Then I fill the space with the big granules or Cerabone or uh, Max Resorb because you can place different type of materials inside for sure, and um, um, it's, uh, you have uh, you can have. Uh, um, uh, you should mix this material with the uh, particles of PRF to bring much faster the nutrition. And what is very important, I add as well some metronidazole because when you add metronidazole, you can have much better homo homogenic structure of the um, area, augmented area, and you will control as well these bacterials which can create these uh, bubbles in between the uh, particles of the uh, biomaterial. So uh, say I prefer to use small um, uh, big particles uh, inside, in the middle of the of the sinus, but uh, in the area of the um, uh, lateral wall, I then use very small granules to uh, avoid the irritation by the big particles. Uh, from uh, Roman Maslov, I am really very sorry, I have bad connection. Uh, so if you have bad connection, don't worry, because uh, this um, uh, webinar is uh, recorded and it should be available on the website uh, from uh, tomorrow, and you can uh, watch it uh, one more time uh, without uh, the, the, the need uh, of... of uh, the, um, uh, you don't have to be afraid that you lose something because um, uh, you, it will be available. When you, uh, when your answer was uh, my question, 2,912 mean I understand correct, 2,900, 2,800. This is correct. Exactly what you uh, wrote to me. This is the setting which I have. And what tubes do you usually use uh, with red tip vacuum uh, or and and uh, uh, do you use IPRF? I use IPRF and I use as well uh, with this red tip and I use as well the tubes uh, from Botis, uh, from, from uh, uh, Professor Ehrenfest, and they all work, but with the proper settings. But now I prefer to stay with these settings 2,812 minutes. This gives me the best result. With IPRF, uh, uh, then you have totally different settings because then you have 800 um, rounds per minute and only three minutes uh, of the uh, speed uh, of, the, of the time. Uh, from Daniel Neisberg, thank you for excellent presentation. Uh, thank you as well for these nice and kind words. Uh, from Dr. Margaret Stefanska, what primary stability of implant do you require in TEN technique to get success? Uh, primary stability of the implant is not a big uh, some, uh, issue um, uh, if we use the TENT technique. If we use the TENT technique with the membrane which is fixed on implant, uh, then I, I think that uh, the implant is not loaded with the 
uh, any any occlusal uh, forces. So whenever you reach at least these 10 newton centimeters, I think uh, it is it is enough because uh, the implant will be not uh, loaded with with the occlusal forces. From Paweł Savitsky, it was a pleasure to hear your lecture. What do you do in patients' allergy to metronidazole? When I have, uh, thank you, Pavel, uh, for your uh, nice uh, uh, words. And when I have the allergy to metronidazole, I do not use metronidazole. And instead, um, I do not have any other uh, mixture which um, I apply. Sometimes in the past, I was um, adding some doxycycline as well um, uh, to the um, uh, sinuses. Uh, it was more than 10 years uh, when we were using this protocol. Uh, so if you have the patient uh, with the allergy to metronidazole, you can switch um, to control the bacteria a little bit with the uh, addition of the antibiotic like uh, doxycycline. Uh, this is everything about the uh, questions which I got from you. I am really uh, very glad and uh, very um, honored uh, to, to be uh, the presenter uh, tonight and I hope you liked my presentation and I hope you will see soon in another place. Thank you very much, Dr. Kmielewski, for sharing your lecture and your insightful information with us. We'd also like to thank Botis for making this online course possible. And thank you, our wonderful audience, for your interest and participation. The CE quiz is now available online on the course page, and completing it will allow you to earn your ADA SERP CE credits. The recording will be posted online within the next 48 hours. You receive an email notification with the link to the recording. Further questions for Dr. Kmielewski may be submitted directly on the website, on the courses page, under the Ask the Expert tab. So please go ahead and submit your questions, and Dr. Kmielewski will be sure to get back to you as soon as possible. Please be sure to visit the BOTIS educational platform, www.botisacademy.com, and keep an eye out for our growing schedule of online courses. Thank you again to all, take care, and goodbye.